All right, we're going to be looking at host defenses, which is basically what our immune system is. Now, parts of this aren't what we traditionally think of immune system, but they do all work together. Host defenses then are there a multi-level network of what we call innate non-specific protections. These are going to be a also adaptive protections which are going to be specific uh, and these are commonly referred to as the first second and third line of defense so these all function and cooperate together um, these three different levels and protect us against infection we categorize the host def defenses into either the innate which is the non-specific all right defenses and then the acquired or more specific defenses and then we break those down into sub levels from there into the three lines of defenses so this is a flow chart we're going to look at this several times i highly recommend that you go ahead and memorize this because this is a good little overview um, of all of the defenses okay and you can kind of see them as a snapshot together and so we're going to start with the innate immune system or the innate uh, defense system which is the non-specific system innate means something that you are born with so these are things that we are born with all right um, these are going to be things like physical barriers, microbiota. This is not what you normally think of as our immune system. Okay. And so we're going to start, like I said, we're going to be in the innate system. We're going to look at the first line of defense and the second line of defense. Okay. And then we're going to look at the acquired system. And that's where the third is. And you can see that we also have some cells here that overlap in between. And these do all work in conjunction together. So the first line of defense, then we also can categorize that and break that down into physical type barriers, mechanical type barriers, and chemical type barriers. So the innate defenses are something that we are born with and they are non-specific. So that means they're kind of like a broad spectrum type of thing. They will try to fight off any foreign invader, so to speak, that wants to try to gain entry. Okay, so that is our first line of defense there is to stop something from getting into where it shouldn't be. All right. Um, and so we have physical and chemical barriers that actually block entry of microbes, other foreign agents, whether they are living or not. Um, and so some of these here are shown in this figure to the right. We've got sebaceous glands that put off earwax and that is going to physically block. And now some of these things fall in two categories. So, for instance, the, the earwax, um, sweat, tears, these also have chemicals in them as well. So they kind of fall into two. All right, um, mucous membranes or mucus saliva, uh, cilia, uh, pH having a very low or a very high pH, sweat, stomach acid, intestinal enzymes. Um, I like to talk about what we call flow of fluids. That's going to be tears, saliva, sweat, um, defecation, vomiting, um, anything where you have a fluid sort of. Um, flushing things out you know so it's going to be flushing things out and having intact skin with no cuts or openings in them urination is, is another flow of fluid type thing so the skin is the largest organ in the body and this is our primary mode of defense okay it has an outer layering layer called the stratum corneum which is a very tough outer layer um, that is going to be basically pushed together uh, if you remember from anatomy um, as it gets further and further from the layer below it is moving away from nutrients and so it dies and it gets what we call keratinized it has keratin which is a protein and it gets squished together and it basically it makes a very thick tough layer that is basically waterproof okay so very few pathogens can penetrate this unless it is broken okay um, and then it does constantly slough off and so we are regenerating regenerating our skin cells down here and so this is constantly being pushed off and sloughs off and we lose that very very top layer of skin which is also removing microbes okay so you're mechanically removing them uh, the hair shaft here um, 
is also shed off. That's what desquamated means. The hair shaft actually even comes off as well, which we remove. And then the flushing effect of sweat that would go under our flow of fluids. And also sweat, like I said, has one, it's got a lot of salt in it. And remember, salt is a desiccation agent. It's going to pull water out of organisms. Water follows salt. It's going to pull water out of organisms. Um, it also has lysozyme, I believe, in it. Um, it's, it's just got some other chemicals in there that are antimicrobial in nature. So with mucous membranes, basically anywhere that opens to the outside. So we're very familiar with the mucous membranes up here, right, in our respiratory system. But anything that opens towards the outside, so our um, vaginal opening, anal opening, those are all actually mucous membranes, okay? So we include digestive, urinary, um, and respiratory, and even the eye in these as well, okay? So mucus, you know, is very thick, and so what does it do? Well, it doesn't necessarily kill bacteria, but if it's all thick and sticky it's, and gross, right, it actually traps bacteria and keeps them from attaching. They can't get through all that mucus to attach, okay? And then we have cilia, which actually in our uh, respiratory passages, which actually actually sweep and move that mucus out, which gives us a mechanical removal as well. And then if the mucus is flowing, like if we have a cold, then there's removal there also. Blinking and tear production is also flow of fluids, fl flushing things out of the eye. Um, saliva carries microbes down to the stomach. Well, why is the stomach a harsher place? Well, hydrochloric acid, your stomach is very acidic. Most microbes cannot survive there. There is an exception to that, and that is H. pylori, which is the uh, bacterium that can actually cause a peptic ulcer, all right? And then, as I said already, vomiting, defecation, those can, um, diarrhea, those can get uh, substances flushed out of the body, and microorgan microorganisms flushed out of the body. This is one of the reasons why they often don't want you to take medication when diarrhea first sets in, because that is your body's way of getting rid of the toxin or the bacteria, whatever is causing the problem. So here to the right, you can see this picture here of the cilia that actually are in our respiratory tract. Um, so the mucus, as I said, likes to trap um, you can think of those glue traps for mice that traps the bacteria, and then the cilia will act to sweep it out, which is very important because that keeps it from gaining entry, from getting uh, attachment, and gets it out of the body, okay? Um, so nasal hair then is also going to help trap larger particles as well. You can have a copious flow, which means a whole lot, of uh, mucus and fluids that provide that flushing action as well. So when that nose is running, it's actually kind of doing you a favor. It's annoying, and we usually take medication to stop it, but again, it serves a purpose, okay? Um, so ciliated epithelium is what is going to have the cilia here, and that's what you're going to find in things like your trachea. All right, that are going to have that cilia that's going to help with that sweeping action. Uh, we sometimes call this the cilia, ciliatory escalator. All right, um, sneezing that is a reflex that will expel a large amount of microbes and other things out into the air at a very high velocity. Foreign matter that is found in the bronchi, trachea, and larynx will trigger the cough reflex. And so you will cough things out. Cilia also will help bring it up to where that cough reflex can get it out as well. Um, the respiratory tract is also guarded from infection by lots of very highly effective adaptations. Like we said, nasal hair traps larger particles. That copious flow of mucus and fluids, all right, especially during allergy and cold se uh, season to flush it out. Um, the respiratory tree um, containing that ciliated epithelium and the ciliatory es escalator moving particles out. Um, that's all, those are all adaptations would help us to get rid of um, this foreign material, okay? We also have very sensitive bronchi um, that are going to help bring those items up. 
the genital urinary tract is going to include, include uh, the genital area and our urinary areas. All right. Um, and so we have that constant trickle of urine going through the u ureters. That's a, a flow of fluids there that can flush out bacteria. Emptying your bladder can flush the urethra. Vaginal secretions have chemicals in them, um, so they can act as a chemical line of defense. Um, the pH in, your, in the vagina is a little bit different. Um, and then they also, you have uh, those secretions, which is going to be under flow of fluids, all right? And for the males, they are going to be um, cleaning theirs out through their urethra, okay? Um, so these are all very important defense mechanisms that we just don't think about. Um, also, urine itself is, is, is slightly, um, is a chemical defense. All right, so the next one is the human microbiome, all right? Um, and so we tend to always think about bacteria as being very negative and uh, harmful, but they're, most of them are actually mutualistic or beneficial, all right? Um, and so the microbiome is an integral part of our anatomy. It can block antagonistic, antagonistically, as we've already said, the access of pathogens. It can create that unfavorable environment by competing for nutrients, competing for space, by altering and changing the pH of an area, secreting chemicals, all as byproducts of their metabolism. Um, and so they form that structural barrier. They, if they are, are in the way, they can stop access of pathogens, uh, pathogens to get to epithelial services, sorry. Um, we have found that things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, these actually may be the result of attempts to free our environment of these microbes um, because we tend to over treat them with antibiotics and that kind of gets our microbiome off kilter. So it's not really where it needs to be. All right, so um, the chemical defensive defenses, and I've talked a little bit about these, um, we have um, lots of lactic acid and electrolytes and sweat, sebaceous secretions, all right? Um, and so we have those sebaceous glands that have an antimicrobial effect because they're producing these chemical substances. In the stomach, we have hydrochloric acid. The digestive juices and bile in the intestines are also antimicrobial. Semen has antimicrobial chemicals in them. Um, glands in your eyelids that, that lubricate the conjunctiva also have antimicrobial chemicals in them as well. Uh, the pH of the vagina, I said, is protective and it's maintained actually by the normal microbiota there. Tears have lysosomes. Such saliva has lysosome, which is an enzyme that hydrolyzes, which means water loosening, the peptidoglycan in the cell wall of bacteria, effectively killing them. So what happens when we lose this first line of fence? This is a big deal. Um, the um, Example I have here is burns because that can really be a problem if somebody has burns over a large portion of their body. Um, now the first line of, uh, well, let's, let me, I'm sorry, I made off track here. So the loss of immunity uh, or absence of this immunity um, can cause us to become very, very susceptible to infections, okay? So if you have a burn, um, one, you're gonna need fluids because you're gonna be drying out very, very much so, but you are very, very susceptible to infection because that first outer wall is gone, okay? So that's one of the reasons burn care is so vitally important, okay? You can also have problems with blockages in the sal salivary glands, <laughs> tear ducts, intestines, uh, urinary tract. When you stop that flow of fluids, that can put you at a greater risk for getting an infection in those areas as well. So this should be pretty easy to answer right now. I uh, probably should have moved on down in the uh, PowerPoint a little bit. Uh, so the presence of intestinal microbiota is considered what? A first line of defense, a second line of defense, a third line of defense, or none of the above. Pause it and come up with your answer. Hopefully you've been paying attention and you should absolutely say, hey, that's all we've talked about so far. Um, it looks like I forgot to put a little NCLEX um, banner here at the top. Um, but anyway, good review question. So moving on now to the second line of defense, 
So we're here. This is going to be both cellular and chemical and is going to come into play immediately whenever anything gets past our first line of defense, whenever we get past those physical and chemical barriers. OK, um, and so one of the most important parts of this is going to be inflammation. We're going to talk a lot about inflammation. OK, uh, T cells, natural natural T uh, killer cells. I don't think we talk about that really maybe we do but I don't remember it being in the PowerPoint until we get over here but those kind of act as a go-between between between the second and third line of defense uh, and these do kind of all work together they're not really completely separate all right um, and so these are still kind of general and broad spectrum in nature and so we still consider them non-specific but they do support and interact closely with some of the more specific entities, okay, of the acquired um, defenses here, all right, so uh, because of those shared cells between the two. So we have four major categories of the immune system here, of the innate immune system. Inflammation, we have complement, and you probably should write this down, complement cascade, and we'll get into that phagocytosis, and then the production of interferons, okay? So these are four major categories uh, of the innate immune system, okay? Um, and these pretty much fall all under the second line of defense here, okay? Um, and that's kind of similar to these four categories here, uh, but this is just a little bit different way of looking them. Antimicrobial products are interferons. Um, it's kind of putting fever in uh, a different place here. So it's really important. Um, Complement cascade triggers inflammation. So it's not so much that they're different. Uh, I just want you to look at it kind of in that way, if that makes sense. So our second line of defense, uh, complement actually triggers inflammation and phagocytosis both. Uh, those are really important mechanisms. And so we have those defense mechanisms of our anatomical and physical barriers but we also have internal cellular and chemical defenses, okay? Phagocytosis and inflammation. And then we have fever, which is one of our natural responses. And we have some natural antimicrobial substances that we produce ourselves. Okay, so phagocytosis, remember phagocytosis means cell eating. So we have some special cells that actually do this. Um, they're gonna go around and find uh, one foreign invaders and uh, they're going to phagocytize them. They're gonna engulf them, dissolve them, eat them and spit out <laughs> the debris basically. Um, they also do some cleanup activities where they clean up particulate matter, also injured or dead cells. And so our cells don't don't live forever and so we have to do something with them when it is ever whenever it is their you know set time to die and so they also function that way as well uh, but we're particularly interested in their phagocyte their function of um, phagocytizing foreign invaders okay um, dendritic cells will actually uh, phagocytize them and extract antigens from them and go and present that to other cells, which is an immu some immunogenic information. So we have three types of phagocytes here, neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells. These first two are the two most, um, the two that do this the most, okay? Neutrophils and macrophages. Macrophages and dendritic cells both actually come from monocytes and they just Dif differentiate into or change grow up so to speak into these two different cells um, once they change locations okay um, all cells technically have some ability to engulf materials but phagocytes are professionals they do this for a living okay that's the way to think about that neutrophils are really good general purpose phagocytes um, they react very early in the inflammatory process, especially to bacteria, um, some form material or damaged tissues. Um, they do have a limited ability in and of themselves to do phagocytosis because what they do is they produce a toxic form of oxygen to kill the bacteria. Uh, and then if they're exposed to that, um, they die themselves. So it's almost kind of like a suicide mission, okay? Um, so if you do a CBC and you have a high neutrophil count, in the blood, that is a very common sign or indicator of a bacterial infection. 
So our function right now here is looking at how these monocytes differentiate into macrophages, but they do also differentiate into the dendritic cells. Um, and they're called that because they look like um, nervous system cells. They look like they have dendrites. So they're transformed basically into macrophages after they migrate out of the bloodstream. Okay, so when they leave the bloodstream, they actually change a lot. They get larger. They have uh, they start to grow lysosomes and other organelles that they didn't have before as a monocyte. Okay. Um, we also have histiocytes, and these are going to live in a let me turn that off, a certain tissue and then remain there uh, during the rest of their uh, lifespan. We have alveolar, al alveolar macrophages, which live in the lung, um, Nufker cells that um, will, will reside in the liver, dendritic cells are often found in the skin. Uh, macrophages are also found heavily in spleen, lymph nodes, bone marrow, kidney, bone, brain, okay? Some macrophages are also kind of just kind of float around. Um, about three to seven percent of your circulating white blood cells, okay, uh, three to seven are going to be your macrophages, okay. And remember, these are very important uh, phagocytes. They might migrate into the body tissues to become macrophages. So this is just kind of showing you how here we've got our alveolar macro, macrophage, okay? Uh, we've got our liver cells with the Kupfer cells, and then we have some dendritic cells here in the uh, epithelium, okay, in the epidermis. So when those differentiated macrophages and dendritic cells arrive in tissues, they're going to be, be near a portal of entry or a filtration organ. And so they're often going to take residents up in there permanently, basically waiting to attack foreign invaders. So it's kind of like that's their post. If they're in the military, you know, sometimes they will send somebody, this is your post, you're going to sit here and watch and protect. That's their job. All right, so phagocyte cell eating. Phagocytosis is the process of engulfment, okay, uh, to attack and dismantle foreign cells. And this can be an isolated event or part of that orchestrated events of inflammation. So the events of phagocytosis, okay, and you can kind of see this going on in this picture here. We've got what we call chemotaxis, all right? Chemo means chemical and taxis means movement. This is going to occur with the phagocyte. So when you have an injury, chemicals are released. We have chemokines, chemical transmitters that are going to be released that will attract the phagocyte to the area. So the phagocyte itself, our, our defense uh, cell is going going to um, be attracted there and they're going to participate in chemotaxis, chemochemical taxis, think taxi, it's movement. So chemical orchest orchestrated movement, okay? Uh, sometimes uh, this is at the site of injury, like I said, by those chemical messengers. It can also be due to inflammation or products given off by a parasite, okay? So sometimes we don't even have to send out the chemical messengers, just the chemicals produced by invaders will attract the phagocyte there as well. Okay, so next we're going to have adhesion by the bacteria. So the bacteria we know has to find a way to stick to our system somehow, our cell. Okay, and so adhesion is going to occur by the bacteria. Then once it is adhered, okay, or, sorry, I'm saying that um, like the bacteria is adhering on its own and really this is going to be more um, adhering to the bacteria so that we can engulf it. All right. Sorry, I got off track there. Um, so we're going to add here or we're going to go and stick to the bacteria so that we can engulf it and digest it. OK, so the, the phagocyte is going to be attracted to uh, the site. It's going to find the bacteria and attach to the bacteria. OK, um, and so then it has these are guys are going to have pseudopods. The phagocytes are going to have pseudopods and enclose the cells or particles in a phagosome. All right. And so here you can see that engulfing and it's just going to kind Kind of engulf around it and ingest them in. This is going to be a form of endocytosis, okay? So they're going to ingest them into a vacuole, which is going to then secrete more cytokines, okay? Chemical messengers, which is going to ramp up the response, all right? Bring more of these to the area. And we're going to form what we call the phagolysosome, okay? And so this here, they call the phagosome. And then we're going to have the lysosome.
lysosome and the phagocyte form together this little thing here called the phagolysosome. All right, lysosomes are going to migrate to the phagosome and fuse with it, forming the phagolysosome. So we're going to have uh, granules for destruction that have antimicrobial chemicals in them. They're going to be released. That's going to break down the material and help uh, it to be ingested or killed, destroy it. And then basically you're going to excrete small portions of undigestible particles via exocytosis. So basically they're going to swallow, um, chew them up, digest them, dissolve them, and spit them out. <laughs> okay, that's the simplified form. All right, so inflammation, and I give this to you now, and then I give it to you again, kind of where the textbook has it. But I think it's important to understand inflammation. I'm not going to go into uh, all the details I have listed here on the right because we do cover it, uh, but I wanted to make sure that it was covered and it didn't appear to be covered um, until I get to it, I think, in the next chapter. Okay, so Inflammation is easily identifiable by a classic series of sign and symptoms. Some give the four classic ones, and that's rubor, color, tumor, dolor, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Some also include loss of function. This textbook includes loss of function, which is important, okay? Um, many chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, these are caused by chronic inflammation. Factors that cause inflammation include trauma, uh, tissue injury, physical or chemical agents, specific immune reactions. This can be localized. I hit my knee on a barrel and it swelled up greatly. Um, or systemic, you can have systemic inflammation, which is much more of a problem. Some researchers believe that aging is actually a consequence of increasing inflammation in multiple body systems, okay? Uh, which is probably partially correct. Uh, primary functions here are going to be, in other words, why do we have inflammation to mobilize and attract um, components to the site of injury, our immune components to the site of injury. We got to call the army in, okay? Um, to set in motion the mechanisms needed to repair tissue damage and uh, localize uh, things and clear a harmful, clear the way for a harmful substance to be flushed out, okay? Block entry uh, of microbes from getting further and, of course, to destroy microbes themselves. So the goal is defensive, yet it can actually cause tissue injury and destruction and disease, especially when it is out of balance, okay? In other words, when it is an over response. All right, so let's look at some more details here for information. Um, the processes that lead to inflammation are dynamic in a predictable series of events that last from a few minutes to a few hours, okay? So once the initial injury has occurred, a chain reaction takes place at the site of damaged tissues, summoning beneficial cells and fluids to the injured area, okay? So the first step here is going to be the immediate reaction following the injury. After an injury occurs, arterials capules and venules near the damaged area are changed by the nervous system using chemical mediators okay things like cytokines these are going to be released like we said in the injured area some are vasoactive which means that they can affect skin cells and smooth muscle cells which can in turn and this is where the vaso comes into play uh, vessel blood vessels um, cause dilation and constriction on blood vessels others are what we call chemotactic uh, in other words chemokines which are going to uh, affect white blood cells okay um, vascular reactions, and so this is when that vasoactive um, component comes into play and is started. Um, so vasoactive reactions, these are going to be very quick. Blood vessels are going to dilate, constrict, and dilate again, and that acts to flush irritants like bacteria away, bring blood products like our white blood cells, platelets, fibrin to the site, Vasodilation is going to also bring fluid into the area. Um, 
and of course those immune com components I already uh, mentioned and this is what is going to give you the redness and warmth you've increased that highway so you have more blood so you're going to have more redness and you're going to have more warmth because your your, your uh, blood is going to carry some warmth with it all right so this also causes the vessels to be what we call more permeable all right and you can see this down here in this picture all right well I think you can maybe that's in the next picture um i think that's in the next picture but uh it, it allows the vessels to be more permeable and so some substances that need to leave the blood vessels and enter the tissues can actually kind of slip through those endothelial cells um, and get where they need to go okay and so they become what we call leaky all right, so uh, the next two steps, number three and four, uh, of inflammation is going to be the formation of edema and pus. Um, and so what is edema? Edema is going to be um, that excess fluid in an area. So local swelling and hardness are then going to occur to edema. If you've had edema, if you've experienced that swelling. Uh, so fluid, and I guess we've all experienced that at some point. Fluid is going to contain plasma proteins, globulins, uh, albumin, fibrinogen, which is a clotting factor, blood cells, cell debris, lots of things, okay? So if it's clear, we call it serous fluid. Um, it can also have red blood cells or pus, uh, which is going to be white blood cells and, and debris, okay, and some dead bacteria, hopefully anyway, right? Uh, so sometimes you can also have fibrin threads show up and be laying down. Uh, fibrin clots will get, are going to trap um, microbes and prevent them from sp spreading. So if you have a clot there forming where you have a cut, okay, it's going to seal off that cut and not allow bacteria in. So this is part of the reason why it's important to not pull scabs off. Also that increases scarring, okay. Um, so fibrin clots are going to trap those microbes, prevent them from getting gaining entry. Uh, then we're going to have massive amounts of neutrophils show up as well so they can do their job. Next, we're going to have resolution and scar formation. Um, repair occurs last. Uh, last, um, This is going to leave either normal tissue, if it is healed completely, depending on how deep the cut is, or scar tissue, depending on, you know, like I said, the level of the damage. All right. Um, macrophages leave blood vessels via a process we call diapedesis. All right. Ped refers to feet. Okay. And this is this is basically uh, movement. It's almost like a walking through cells. It's really kind of neat. Um, stem cells are going to be in the area, are going to divide, and then they will repopulate the damaged area with new cells. All right. All right. So um, here's an example of this diapedesis. You can see here these, these are there we go. These are our squamous epithelial cells, right? They're single, so they're simple squamous epithelium. Um, and so you can see here there's this gap. This is where we get the permeability and the leakiness of the vessels, okay? And so then these white blood cells can migrate out via diapedesis. They're kind of squeezing through the gap there. Um, and so they're actively mobile and uh, ready to change shape. Um, the endothelial cell lining contains adhesive receptors that actually capture white blood cells and transport them into the extracellular spaces. Chemotaxis is migration, as we already said, of cells in response to a chemical stimulus. And so basically cells will swarm from many compartments to the site of infection and remain there to perform general and specific immune functions. Okay, so why is, uh, what is the function, I guess I should say, of edema and those leaky vessels? Well, you can already kind of see, we've talked about those, um, the fact that we need to get uh, material to the area and uh, we need to open up the door, so to speak, to allow them in. The secretion of excess fluids and neutrophils is definitely beneficial. Edema is the liquid leakage of excess fluids into the tissues, which is also going to help dilute toxins, which is one thing I haven't talked about yet. Um, the neutrophils that are surrounding the site, of course, are going to phagocytize and destroy bacteria and then clean up dead tissue and debris as well. So they're going to kind of go in and, and be general cleanups. 
guys, all right? Um, so they can accumulate and create pus, which also contains a bacteria and liquefied cell debris. Um, some bacteria really, really strongly uh, attract neutrophils and form pus. And this is what we call being a pyogenic bacteria. Okay. And so you can see there are some forms here of that streptococci, staphylococci, meningococci. These guys really stimulate our system to send lots of bacteria. And so one of the symptoms you will have is a whole lot of pus. So next we're going to talk about fever. Why do we have fever and what is a fever? Why is fever beneficial? Well, it reduces the ability of an organism to multiply. Uh, if they are temperature sensitive, it will increase phagocytosis, um, increase metabolism, and stimulate hematopoiesis. And so that temperature, if, if they're sensitive to high temperatures, of course, it's going to denature their proteins and possibly kill them. All right. Um, and so what is the difference between fever and hyperthermia? Um, I might be getting a little uh, ahead here. Um, but it's really important to understand there is a difference. Have you ever thought about why do we have fever with chills? Why, why do you get chills and shiver when you're already running a fever? Well, because a fever, a fever actually resets the normal set point for your temperature. Okay, your normal thermostat, the hypothalamic thermostat to it sets it to a higher setting because your body wants to keep that temperature elevated to fight off these bacteria. All right. And so when you're getting chills as you have a fever, it's because your body is trying to keep that temperature up or shift it up where it needs to go. And it wants to stay there. Uh, if you've had young children, they tend to get a lot of these childhood viruses and they tend to have a lot of fever. All right. And I know I had a couple that just ran fever with everything. And sometimes that fever was really hard to control. You give them Tylenol. As soon as that Tylenol, what would happen? shoot right back up. Why is that? That's because you have raised your normal set point temporarily. Your hypothalamus has raised and reset that thermostat to a higher level, okay, to try to keep that temperature where it is. Um, and so that's, that's why that happens, okay. Um, so a, a fever that doesn't have a known origin is a fever of unknown origin. Um, it can be associated with allergies, cancer, or even other um, organic type illnesses. Okay. Uh, and so substances that reset to the, the reset the hypothalamus thermostat to a higher set a setting are going to be things like uh, exogenous uh, pyrogenes, um, products of infectious agents like viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, algae, blood, blood products, vaccines, injectable solutions even, that come from outside of the uh, body. Those are all ex 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 exogenous pyrogens. Sorry, I said pyrogenes, which is a bacteria. Um, pyrogens, okay? A pyrogen resets your thermostat. Exo meaning outside. So those were external thermostat resetters. We also have endogenous pyrogenes. So internal thermostat resetters. resetters. These are going to be things like uh, monocytes, neutrophils, uh, macrophages, um, particularly IL-1, interleukin-1, and tumor necrosis factors. Those two uh, are really high on the list that can do this, all right? Um, and so body temperature normal is about 98.6, and you know there's an, a bit of variance for people. I tend to run really low. I tend to run more around 96 or 97, all right? And so having a fever, a low-grade fever is 37.7 to 38.8, which means 100 to 101. So you've got to have a least a hundred for it to be considered a temperature. A 99, I'm sorry, a fever. A 99 is not a fever, okay? Um, now, a high-grade fever, that's going to be something that is very high, 104 to 106 Celsius. I'm sorry, Fahrenheit. Um, you get above that and it becomes very, very dangerous. All right, so what are the benefits of fever? We've mentioned some of these. It makes it uh, difficult um, for microorganisms to uh, follow through with their um, metabolism, okay? So it inhibits the multiplication of particular substances like poliovirus, colds, herpes zoster, uh, and systemic and subcutaneous types of fungal pathogens.
It can also reduce the availability of iron. I don't believe that's something we've talked about yet. Um, iron binding proteins are another defense mechanism um, and running fever causes us to bind to free iron in our blood. So why do bacteria carry, care whether or not there's free iron in our blood? Well, some bacteria actually use iron as part of their nutrition source. They need it for their metabolism. And so if they come in and they find iron, Iron, then it's going to be much easier for them to survive. So if we bind more iron to our hemoglobin or to our myoglobin, then it is not available for them to uh, obtain. Although some of them have mechanisms where they can actually go and steal it. <laughs> but I'm not getting into there yet. There's not going to be siderophores. Um, Anyway, so it can stop bacteria from gaining access to iron, which is important for their metabolism, all right? Um, and then it can increase our metabolism and increase the action of our immune system, okay, and our natural physiological uh, processes that are protective in nature, hematopoiesis, phagocytosis, and of course, some immune reactions. Um, Benefits of fever make it a difficult decision whether or not to treat it. A lot of times when children are young, they have ear infections and things. Uh, if it's not high, they will want um, the parent to allow the fever to do its job and, and moderate or monitor that um, and let it run its course so it can do its job and we can maybe offset the use of antibiotics. There are side effects. Um, if you've had a high fever, you know a lot of times you can actually have a very high heart rate with it, a tachycardia. Um, you can also have uh, an elevated respiratory rate. So anytime your heart rate is higher, your breathing generally increases. You know, you're going to breathe in. Um, lowering of the seizure threshold. So somebody that's prone to seizures um, has a fever, they may be more likely to have it. Of course, if you have an extremely high fever, it may induce um seizures okay um medical experts however agree that high and prolonged fever fevers in people with cardiovascular disease head trauma seizures or other respiratory uh illnesses should be treated immediately so there are some things well they'll say let the fever do its course but there's sometimes uh when your body just doesn't really know that it doesn't need to run fever because it has another issue okay and you might cause a problem so our body also produces some other uh, antimicrobial type products. These are going to be like our interferons, all right? And there are many of these. These are small proteins that are processed naturally by white blood cells and tissues. Um, they are primarily uh, directed against viruses, but they do have some other functions as well. We have alpha and beta interferons. Um, these can be produced by fibroblasts and macrophages and lymphocytes. We also have a gamma interferon that is produced by T cells. Uh, some of the biological activities these guys have, they're going to bind to cell surfaces and induce changes in genetic expression. Um, all three of the different types of interferons can inhibit expression of cancer genes and have tumor suppression effects. Uh, interferon alpha and beta can trigger phagocytosis or stimulate phagocytes. Uh, into action and the interferon gamma is the immune regulator of macrophages for T and B cells. All right, so a uh, complement cascade. Complement is a series of proteins that trigger um, all these little changes in other proteins um, and then they cause uh, things like inflammation and phagocytosis to occur, okay? Um, it's named because of its property of complementing immune reactions, and its job is to primarily to destroy bacteria, but it can also have some effects on viruses, parasites, or nearby cells. So a cascade reaction is a sequential physiological response where the first substance in a chemical series will activate the next substance. So you'll have one here, it's going to be reacted and then it's gonna cause something to happen, okay? And then this is gonna react and it's gonna cause something to happen. So it's basically like the domino effect. And so it's going to activate the next substrate or chemical in the series, okay? Um, and so we have four stages, um, initiation, and we also say that things can fix complement, and that means initiation, um, the activation and cascade, 
polymerization and membrane attachment. And so we'll look at those. All right, so let's look at the four stages of the complement cascade. This, remember, this is a system of proteins that act to lice, foreign cells, and viruses. Okay, now let's trigger inflammation. Excuse me. So for initiation, we're going to have a, pre, a protein. Remember, there's like 30 of these proteins, and so we're not getting into all the details. And they have names, basically C for complement and three for the number of um for the number of the protein okay that's how they're named so c3 that's generally going to be the first protein in the cascade it's going to um be either free or bound to a pathogen's membrane it's going to be hydrolyzed remember that is a reaction water loosening where water is added to separate a substance and so it's going to split into two fragments or pieces that's going to be c3b and c3a and then we're going to have the activation and cascade okay um, so further enzymes are going to come into play here the c3b protein is going to split as a result to them and uh, you're going to split into c5 c5a and c5b okay Okay, and so you can see how this is kind of a sequence of events. Then we're going to have what we call polymerization, where C5B is now loose and free, and so it's going to form a complex or join up with C6, C7, and C8 and form what we call the membrane attack complex. Okay, and so this membrane attack complex is going to be positioned on and form pores in the offending cell's membrane, which can cause it to do what? If you poke a hole in a balloon filled with water, what's going to happen? All the water is going to run out. So it loses structural integrity. And so that's going to lead to the inappropriate flow of water and ions out of the cell and the cell will lice or rupture. So there are actually three pathways for complement. Um, this textbook only looks at two. There's another one with proteins called A, B, and, and A, D, and P, but we don't have to worry about those. It's not in this textbook. We're going to look at these two uh, main ways, and I kind of like this way that it's narrowed down. So we have the, cat, the classical complement pathway, which was the first one we found, and then they were very creative with the name of the next one, which they call the alternative complement pathway, okay? Um, and so for the classical Pass, pathway, um, antibodies on the cell surface are going to bind to the complement protein. So this is going to be antibodies and the complement protein that bind, okay? That is going to trigger complement, all right? Um, and so then that series of events will occur. And some of the little series of events in these three or these two pathways are a little bit different, uh, but they're basically, they have the same beginning and the same end results, okay? And that's going to be like uh, phagocytosis, cytolysis, and inflammation, okay? Um, and so the alternative complement pathway, is, instead of the uh, antibody binding, is going to be the antigen that binds to the complement protein. And so that's going to be triggered, of course, by um, um, foreign cell antigens, um, and this is a much shorter pathway, so the response is quicker. Other antimicrobial products that our body has also include some peptides or short proteins. They're 20 to 50 amino acids long. We have things like defensin and some others. Uh, defensin can actually insert themselves into bacterial membranes, creating a pore in the membrane. If enough pores form, then the cell will lice. You poke enough holes in it, it's going to rupture, right? Um, this can also have an effect on other actions of non-specific and specific immunity areas. Um, um, and it's very effective against large groups of microorganisms. And so researchers are actually looking at this for potential uh, for uh, therapeutic drugs, okay? Um, they want to turn these antimicrobial peptides into uh, a therapeutic drug. 